Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host Jivraj and today I have with me a very special guest. Join me in welcoming Sai Srinivas, the co-founder and CEO of MPL, which is one of India's largest gaming startups. Thank you so much Sai for joining me. I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting you today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to this chat. Great to hear that Sai and I think MPL is one of those stories that I as an ecosystem enthusiast have really look up to because I think the scale at which you've grown the speed at which you've grown more importantly and the kind of disruption you're doing not just in India but across the <clears throat> world now is absolutely spectacular so I'm hoping to get a few nuggets of learnings from this journey and more uh, through this conversation but to get us started I want to really understand the kind of clarity of vision and ambition you had when the MPL journey got started because from day 1 you've been very clear about the size of the market about the kind of market you want to go after uh, the pmf was also very clear thankfully enough for mpl from day 1 and so so the ambition even got more further amplified right so if you can give us a brief overview of what was it like to start mpl what was the kind of structure you had when starting up and any cues that you might have for early builders when they're looking at markets when they're considering the kind of products they want to build for the future Sure. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, question. See, I think <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, MPL was my second rodeo, right? Like, so I in my first avatar, we started a hardware company, right? And I think the one thing we kind of realized after running that company for three years and then exiting is that we were very clear, both me and my co-founder, that this time, whenever we start, we are not going to touch the physical world. we are not going to do anything with atoms the only thing we will focus on is bytes right and we said that's the first rule that we set for ourselves i think the second rule that we set for ourselves was that we wanted to be in an industry where revenue is from day zero we we didn't want to be uh, we didn't want to be or we personally didn't want to build a company where uh, revenue is delayed and 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 at times we tend to forget this even in our own company when we are trying to make some new products and stuff like that uh, but but you know in the early days we used to always say revenue delayed is revenue denied so <laughs> i think so yeah. so getting ensuring that your revenue your your business model is watertight right from day zero i think i think the thing with a business model is that if your business is built on a sound model very clear business model that this is uh, this is your revenue this is your cost etc so on and so forth and you have clarity of that i think you as a business will always survive right at times you might go through tough periods at times you might be in happy zones but you know the business model is sound but if the business model is not sound then man like you know it's uh, it's all party till the till there's a high tide yeah. and then you know you're always scared you know when people are going to catch you with your pants down when the tides out right so <laughs> so i think for us uh, for us that was very very important and and uh, especially because we came from a really really tough experience after a first startup when building hardware is not easy and the third thing we decided was uh, that we want to be in a downstream market what i mean by a downstream market is a market which has a lot of tailwinds behind it we didn't want to be in a market where you know we have to go and keep rowing and rowing and rowing right and we we used to say this and we still say this right <clears throat> uh markets are like rivers you can't change their course right it's up to you to choose whether you're rowing downstream or whether you're rowing upstream if you're rowing upstream you can be the best rower in the world but to the outside world you'd still look very mediocre and if you are in a downstream market even if you are like a very average rower outside world says oh man these guys are killing it right yeah. but honestly more often than not it's the market doing what it's doing uh so so for us it was very very clear that these were the tenets right and then before we even get to how we came to the problem and so on and so forth these were the tenets right <clears throat> and and i was very lucky to have worked at zynga at the beginning of my career yeah. as a game designer and as a product manager so i i always always had uh, i mean it, my my choice gaming found me by accident right i didn't go searching for gaming right and yeah. and i'm very grateful for the time that i spent at zynga with some of the most ex- exceptional people uh, um that i've ever worked with right and what i always honestly felt that was you know and I, uh, was that the gaming is a confluence of three things coming together mm-hmm. you need data you need device and you need payments right either one of these pillars are missing then it won't fly right uh, because if it's only data and device yes people will come and play games but how are you going to make money you can't right so you need all these three things and i think in 2018 when we started upi had just taken off in 2016 september 
So UPI was coming off coming off of a year long run and it was doing incredibly well and that kind of changed the entire momentum of the market. And uh, <clears throat> for me, I've always believed personally, I've always believed that gaming in the long term is going to be a professional sport like anything out there. <clears throat> And I used to play a lot of eight ball pool, right? On, on, on my mobile phone, right? I used to play it for hours together. And I always used to wonder, is there a place where I can go register for tournaments? And honestly, because I always wanted to play competitively with uh, other people. And when I couldn't find that, uh, and I was telling Shubh, uh, my co-founder that, hey man, we should build a platform where people can compete in games, in tournaments, and you know, they can earn prize money. And Shubh was like, dude, that's the most ridiculous idea ever, right? And I, I, I still believe it. I, I mean, I still can't believe that, you know, both of us felt it was so ridiculous and it was so stupid. But uh, the fact of the matter, our realization after that is that it's the stupid ideas that usually tend to work because they're so simple. And they're so yeah. easy to understand rather than the rather than the complicated ones. So our entire company's core vision and the core customer value prop is very simple. We want to build products which enable users to earn money and be recognized by playing games. As simple as that, right? And we believe that there are multiple ways of doing that, right? And the the entire ambit of how large gaming is going to be in the world in the next ten years is it's going to be it's going to be probably the most the biggest markets, uh, the biggest market in the world, because if, if there is so, there's so much scope there, there's just so much you could do, right. And so much of creativity that can, that you can put into it, like it's just endless. So that was, that was how we started. And that was the genesis and that was our core customer vision, right? Sorry, the core customer value proposition. And that's what, uh, that's, that's what's still driving us even to the day. No, that that's awesome. I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of great guardrails to building a company from scratch there. And for everyone listening in a lot of food for thought. So thanks for walking us through that. But interestingly enough, you know, I, I mean, I've read up on you, so I know this, but for context, you went from, uh, you know, going to science competitions, winning awards to becoming very enthusiastic about aerospace engineering to becoming enthusiastic about product to gaming uh, to design, I think, right. And then you started a hardware company to now leading a gaming company the personal evolution seems uh, like very steep there right so do you have any maybe guardrails for how you have personally grown alongside your peers in this journey and what have maybe you know what are some changes that have positively impacted your career span your ideology as a founder and even as an entrepreneur right so thank you for that uh, question uh, i think uh, uh, you know jivraj uh, <clears throat> i've been very very fortunate to have been at the right place at the right time multiple times in my life, right? And and uh, I think people often tend to think that, you know, when they do well, they think, hey, you know, I killed everything and I did a great job. And when you do things badly, you think, oh man, I screwed everything up. But the fact of the matter is, it's never that way. It's always somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And for all of us who are, you know, I'd say reasonably successful and uh, have a reasonably decent career, I think there's a lot of right place, right time to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I think <clears throat> I was in IIT Kanpur in two, from 2006 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of being in IIT Kanpur at that time was that IIT Kanpur had internet as good or even better than what we have today in our homes back then in the campus. So mm -hmm. it kind of gave us a sneak peek of how the future was going to be. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 it's it was it was remarkable, right? To think of internet that fast. You know, we do we could download movies at like <laughs> 10 seconds, no, 10 seconds is a little too much, but in a minute, right? Yeah. And it's just quite ridiculous, right? So, and we were, and for me, that was, and it was the first time I was actually exposed to internet at that scale and that speed, right? Yeah. So the, the amount of things that, that it was just like, you know, how do I put it? It was like a kid in a candy park or a candy store or like, you know, yeah. and I think the, the thing for me that's always been very important is that I've always wanted to build products and it really didn't matter which kind of a product it is, right? Mm -hmm. And I really am not too fussed or perturbed about failure. Uh, so, so just so you know, in even in IIT in my four years, I failed five courses and mm -hmm. I managed to make it out in time in four years. I mean, it's not something to be proud of, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. You know, given a given an option, I'd love to go back and like, you know, not, not do mm -hmm. that, right? But <clears throat> what, what they fundamentally taught me was that, you know, Failure in that instant seems to be like a big deal, but uh, in the long run, it just makes you much, much more tolerant, right? And what that did for me was that 
it made me very open minded to actually try new things and keep trying new things right so i've never been one to say that you know i won't build this product or i won't build that product i always have been of the opinion that i'll do whatever i feel like right and if i feel like building hardware i'll go build hardware if i feel like making a game i'll go make a game if i feel like you know building say some other product i'll go build that product and uh, and and from my point of view i think that is probably the best way you can go about nurturing your uh, skill and i believe that i'm a product builder first and an entrepreneur after right mm-hmm. so given a choice in life uh, uh, you know between being an entrepreneur and a product builder some some people think both of them are same so mm-hmm. be it i'd always choose building product over over being an entrepreneur so for me i think uh, i think it's it's the steep learning is a byproduct of just uh, just valuing the freedom to do what i want to do more than anything else right so right. for me that freedom matters the most uh, mm-hmm. and if that freedom comes in a seed funded 4 million uh, you know 4 million dollar seed funded startup or a 2 million dollar seed funded startup or whatever a uh, half a billion dollar company that's equally good for me very interesting i think that's that's great food for thought because it's just about i mean a lot of people are in the ecosystem still but how it's about how can you utilize and leverage those factors in favor of you if you are given that privilege to be there at the right time so i think uh, that's it's amazing to hear sai uh, i think further you know i want to focus on i think probably what really stands out about mpl is the speed and the scale at which you've grown right uh, to put things into perspective and if i'm not wrong with my numbers it's been 3 years 2.3 billion dollars in valuation more than 90 million consumers across Uh, three to four countries and uh, approximately 1400 1500 odd team members right that's what you've achieved in a short duration of 3 years uh, help us understand what allows you to grow at this velocity constantly and also how do you maintain the dna of being a small company still because i'm guessing that so much of growth at the start and the hockey stick growth looks good at the start because you know you have the advantage of being able to do what whenever but when you have the responsibility of being a large company how do you ensure you can maintain that balance and continue to grow at that velocity i think i'd love your perspective on that front sure i mean uh, see i think uh... uh to be to be brutally honest on ourselves i think we've been very very fast in the first two two and a half years of our company's life i mean honestly this year i think we've been a little slow uh just being being very honest and reflecting back on our company i think by our own standards i'd rate ourselves at a c at best right i i and i think a large part of it is like you said you know this uh, constant tussle between being a large company or i don't know why we are a large company but you know i think we are in the largest scheme of things we are a drop in the ocean right but yeah. and 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 being nimble and being a startup right so uh from i think for us what and so that's the reason i'll focus more on the first two to one and a half years and this is something which is honestly top of mind for both me and my co-founder and we are actively actively changing how we work and for us and what we keep saying internally is we are a band of startups now right so okay. if you if you can't move fast you move out as simple as that right so uh, uh, so the first two to one and a half years i think uh, one of the core founding principles of the company is that we always value outcome more than output so mm-hmm. that essentially means we really don't care if you work 3 hours a week you know 20 hours a week or 100 hours a week it's up to you right the goal is to go and go after the outcome right so there are there are there are people who are really really good at what they do mm-hmm. and they know how to plan their work properly and for us we've always gone after people like that and we've hired those people right if you even if you go to <clears throat> one of the things we are very very grateful for to be honest and in fact proud of is if you go you know and just do a quick search on the kind of people that we've been able to attract and the kind of people we've been able to bring into the company i mean these are these are exceptional people right these are people who are at the top of the game in their respective fields by at least the top 10 top 15 uh, folks in their in their field in fact we were just talking about it right we we now are at a point where we are able to attract art directors and engineering talent from some of the top gaming companies in the world like like you know uh like supercell like right like you know uh different different gaming companies in the world and i and we for us we always feel that moving fast is actually not a function of hustle 
but mm-hmm. it's actually a function of clarity of knowing where you're going right mm-hmm. so if you have clarity of knowing where you're going then you will get there yeah. right and people think people often make this mistake of thinking moving fast is hustling right uh, moving fast is is hus- hustle is important but hustle always comes next to knowing where you want to go right mm-hmm. having this absolute clarity of saying ki you know i need to get there like the in in hindi we keep saying ki zara delhi jana tha par pahunch gaye kahin aur like you know having the clarity of knowing ki this is where you want to get to and like you know uh, this is what i want to build and having that clarity right so the first two two and a half years i think that clarity was 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 paramount right and because it was a smaller team people moved faster people had that clarity and i think as as the company grew i think uh uh some of these automatically become a little slow because people are not as fearless as they were before because the newer the newer set of folks who come in uh you know are aren't going to be as comfortable as some of the older folks and also that being said there was a lockdown and people were working from home so it, it's it's difficult to imbibe those values and those that, that spirit of working when everyone's working out of a zoom window right yeah. so <laughs> so 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 i think for us it's always been that clarity of knowing where we want to go i think as a company when we know that this is where we want to go uh we we inevitably usually get there uh mm-hmm. because building has never been a challenge for us right this is the same set of folks who built a mobile phone in a year flat mm-hmm. right so yeah, so so for us we've been always blessed with exceptionally capable engineering talent thanks to my co-founder uh mm-hmm. so so building has never been a challenge so the issue is you know he, he does the build what should we build and where and you know where are we headed right so yeah. so for anyone who wants to go fast i think the key the key is to know where you're going and if you can mm-hmm. ensure that everybody in your team symmetrically understands that in the same way then you as a team will inevitably move fast you, there's never a situation where you'll move slow got it fair enough i think so much of what i've heard is optimizing for direction over simply speed and of course focusing and over indexing on outcomes more than just output as you i think mentioned in the past as well i love those i love those ideologies i i think further you know i i'm in sure no great company and it's safe to call mpl a great one has no, been i think i think i think we have I, I, I miles to go for sure. Go. Like, yeah, no, no. Long way to go. Yeah. Miles to go for sure, but uh, what you've achieved in the short duration, I think, I'm just uh, over indexing on that. But the underlying factor being no great company is built without a great set of people, and you've focused on that as well. Uh, but there are certain cultural traits that you've spoken of in the past that I want to double click on and maybe you know help us understand better. a uh, one of yeah. them is process orientation and that is almost counterintuitive to the sense that you know when you think of innovation disruption you often don't bracket it in a structural process oriented manner but considering startups also have that and you are a huge proponent of process i'd love to understand how do you process for innovation disruption and how do you build that at scale with the kind of people that you attract uh, i think uh, any cues there would be helpful right so uh, so the, uh, thank you again jibraj for that question see uh, i think people misunderstand processes right in fact my mm-hmm. entire company misunderstood process right <laughs> just being very very honest right yeah. uh, uh, i think people misunderstand process saying that everything should have a process right no mm-hmm. that's not what we mean okay uh, uh, what we mean when we say process is is uh, processes fundamentally are designed to avoid uh, information asymmetry in the company Mm-hmm. that's fundamentally why a process is designed the second reason why a process is designed is to avoid mistakes right mm-hmm. so that if you for example why is what if i were to ask you what is the process for crossing the road like look left look right once it turns green walk right okay. imagine if there was no process i'm sure a lot of people <laughs> were you know would be would, would get would get run over right so fundamentally processes are designed to just avoid mistakes right okay. and 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 i think it's a way careful balance that a company has to craft uh between uh between places where you have to put process and places where you should avoid process right and we as a company also you know uh we as a company have also learned that over the last uh, you know two and a half three years for example uh what we've always meant for process is like we are very serious about our rituals our rituals meaning our reviews our are uh are what we refer to as qrp which is quarterly roadmap planning right we're very serious about these things and these are 
these rituals are very important because it's important to show up to a ritual prepared and that makes the company a really really disciplined and a fit organization it's like saying it's it's basically getting the company to go to a gym man as simple as that right like you know mm-hmm. if there was a gym for a company that's that's what it would be right it's not like you know writing reimbursement forms and you know all of that stuff right those those are those are not those are the mis- those those are those are not processes right uh, but this is what we mean and and there's a reason why that is important and there's a reason why you need to have uh, you need to have some parts of it built into the company if you don't have that then you essentially run the risk of becoming uh how do i put it you run the risk of becoming a complete uh, com- run the risk of becoming chaotic and you run the risk of becoming like there's a lot of tribal knowledge that gets accumulated and tribal knowledge can't scale right mm-hmm. you 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 need you need a certain level of uh, structure to help you scale but you can't overdo it also if you overdo it you end up becoming slow right so that so if you talk to me a year down the line probably i can tell you what is the ideal balance because i can tell you for a fact that in 2021 the the entire company thought process is very important very very important and they put processes in 50000 things and now we've gone ahead and removed a bunch of those processes right so yeah. so probably a year down the line i'll tell you exactly what the balance but the balance fundamentally is you anything which is numbers oriented right anything which is objective science mm-hmm. should ideally always have process anything which is creative should ideally avoid process yeah. i think that is the balance at least what yeah. i have understood so far but yeah. i'll know probably 6 <laughs> months down the line if i'm right or wrong <laughs> yeah i know for sure and i think the last part of your entire flow of thought summarizes it and that's how i look at it as well and maybe like you know better in principle but that just sums it up beautifully uh the second tenant of culture which i think again mpr has done incredibly well is in terms of you know let's say attracting the best kind of talent and then retaining them as well and maybe also letting go if at all which is one thing i want like to know from you right as a founder how do you ensure all three of these things scale relatively well because in an organization which is 1000 plus i'm guessing you're not doing a majority of the recruiting right so how do you mm-hmm. still pass on these initial things that can be very into tip for a founder at the 100 150 employee mark sort of a thing team member mark sort of a thing but how do you pass that on very intuitively very objectively very deliberately through the organization as you scale i think i would love to understand that aspect of things sure see i think uh, uh, for us uh, see great people like to work at honest places right mm-hmm. great people like to work at places where information is very transparent uh good and bad information right if we are all in deep shit we are all in deep shit you know there's nothing to hide from that right yeah. we're all doing well we're all doing well uh you know great people don't people make this mistake of often thinking that great people only like to work at successful places where there's you know crazy amounts of growth it's not the case great people like to work at places which are honest great people like to work at places where people are fundamentally meritocratic and people speak the truth and dishonesty or any kind of uh, uh, you know any kind of dishonest behaviors are completely unacceptable right and for us at mpl one of the most important tenets is absolute honesty and trust for our customers and within right so so that fundamentally enabled us to always attract really really good people and good people the thing is you know when when you're having a conversation with someone who's an exceptionally good data scientist right and you know you have an honest conversation saying hey man like things aren't looking good right and i'm sure that person would also say hey man yeah i agree things aren't looking good and if he's a good data scientist then he'd work on it and make things better right the same is with an engineer same is with a product manager right mm-hmm. uh, i think for us fundamentally that's always been at the core and we've never never left that right even till date um, the one thing i can tell you is every single guy in our industry knows our numbers right and it's transparent it's open right every single guy in the company can access it everything right all the way from the customers num uh, dao to all the way to revenue it's completely out in the open multiple times people have come and said hey man you know what uh, uh, our numbers are so open it's I'm like big deal man like it's me chupane ki kya baat hai jo hai so hai i mean you're you're doing well you're doing well you're not doing well you're not doing well the the cost of 
being secretive and hiding things like this is in the short term it might say oh you know what we are it's it's we are we are protecting ourselves no but in the long run you're being stupid right mm -hmm. and 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 i think the first is that then the second thing is one of our core principles is to always hire people better than yourself right and and for from for us it starts uh, right at the top uh, uh and that essentially means that you know uh, both me and my co-founder have always found people who are better than ourselves and we've trusted them fully and we've given them complete flexibility and freedom so if if you even look at our if you even if you even speak to some of our leaders one of the things they'll tell you is that we're very hands off right we don't tell them what to do how to do so like the thing we keep saying within our company is or we started saying this more clearly now is that the things that we want our team members to value is that they always have the freedom to choose they will always have the courage to act and they can always trust that we've got their back right so so those are our values right so if uh, uh, you know if if that's the case then you know more often than not good people tend to come and the thing with good people is they attract other good people right and the good people being very honest aren't the ones who are making a lot of noise on social media right yeah. even if you are a really good data scientist boss you don't have that much time right to yeah. to you know go and make a lot of noise the good people are the ones who are tucked away in the corners writing code doing doing all the hard work and you know they tend to attract other such good people right so as a company we prefer we prefer that and and that's the reason why i believe at least that's my take and i might be wrong but that's my take as to why we've had some luck with people and in terms of retaining people dude like i said you can talk about 50000 things people talk about perks motorcycles and god knows what else in today's world yeah. but i think uh, uh, a transparent and an honest uh, workplace is 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 probably the most important thing honest honesty at the core of it uh is what makes good people stick right so mm -hmm. and in terms of say letting go of people see man every startup which is worth its salt uh always has you know people it always has come to a situation where they've had to let some people go right mm -hmm. uh i'm sure that will come in imperial's time also i mean it'd be foolish of me to say hey you know what oh kabhi nahi hoga it's bound to happen sometime right uh, hopefully not but you know if it does so be it right and uh and the thing there is it's it's uh it's it's always remember that company as as the leadership team of the company your job and your responsibility is to always keep the company first and do what's right for the company mm -hmm. and yeah and 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 that's how we approach it right and so far so good and we've been very lucky honestly with the kind of people we've been able to get that that's fabulous i think all of it i think boils down to some really cool fundamentals right being very simplistic about things and appealing to the core things that drive people which is again honesty trust and just comfort level and then going to the good people so i love the simplicity at the back of some great principles that you've established at mpl thanks for walking us through that side uh, i think i want to shift gears now and as we go on to you know maybe concludingly parts of the conversation one very fascinating aspect of your business is dealing with externalities i mean what i mean by that is pretty much that there's so many things you can control but there will always be some things that you can't in which case because it is in the gaming space there are things which are unregulated things that are being uh, formulated as you go ahead there's this google thing that happened and a bunch of other things right uh, as a founder and as the leadership of you know a 1000 plus um, member team how do you ensure you kind of you know make peace with things that you cannot control and what do you do about those to begin with because i think that is absolutely fascinating to know yeah yeah i mean the <laughs> this this answer changed every year every three months after starting the company to be honest like i think uh, see i think uh, the thing which is the most important thing in any company is product market fit man right uh and doing what's right for your customer right and in our opinion uh if you do what's right for your customer and you have product market fit neither google nor facebook nor nobody can stop you from reaching your customer right and uh not only us but there are so many other fantastic companies out there in the space who who proven that time and time and time again right uh see i think the first one year of this company's journey i was a very paranoid human being just being brutally honest right i was extremely paranoid right i 
I mean, I used to practically be up all the time. I used to have all the alerts on my phone. I used to like literally chase people down and I used to like, you know, wake them up in the middle of the night, not from a sense of uh, waking them up and say, asking them questions, but more from a sense, more, more from a place of waking them up and asking them, hey man, is everything okay? Is this, this you know, it's coming from a point of, uh, uh, from, yeah, concern more than anything else, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think, and I think what we've learned over the last two, two and a half, three years is that, uh, you know, your business affects only the company, but policy always affects the industry, right? Mm-hmm. So, so uh, whenever we're looking at policy, it's always important that we work together with the industry. And over the last two, two and a half years, I think one of the good things that's happened as, uh, uh, is that the industry has constantly worked together the industry has made representations in some cases you know some uh, some states uh, some states understood it accepted it some states are on the verge of making some breakthrough uh, you know landmark regulations and some states didn't and that's fine and in our point of view uh, in in our point of view we believe that any industry that's worth its weight will go through this right uh, any industry that is a forward-looking futuristic industry, which 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 has meaningful revenues at stake, uh, would have to go through this. It's the cost of growing up, right? If you'd asked me this question a year and a half back, I would have would have probably given you a different answer. But yeah. I think now the way we make peace with it is that um, the way we make peace with it is that just keep doing what's right for your customer, right? Sometimes things sometimes things fall your on your side of the table. Sometimes things don't. But like I said. The difference between business and policy is that business only affects you. Policy affects the entire industry. And when it's an entire industry, then the industry together has a meaningful voice. And and at the same time, when you're in an industry, like when you're building products which are gaming in, in gaming, and when you're uh, and it's an industry which is also very high potential sunrise, but also has associated risks. It's foolish to assume uh, that there are no risks and uh, you know everything's hunky dory. It's important that the industry also acts responsibly, works together, and behaves responsibly, right? And I think I think that is something which we, together as an industry, I believe, have still some way to go. I think uh, I think I think the more maturity we show there and the more togetherness we show there, I think, will will take us a long way. I mean, this is my learning over the last three 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 years or three and a half years. Um, like I said. Uh, one year into this company's journey, I had no clue, man. I had absolutely no clue. Like, it was just like, okay, you know, things are moving, things are moving. What's happening? I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, I hope I hope everything's okay. But yeah. uh, but as things went on, you know, we started understanding and learning more things. And also that being said, now we have an exceptionally great team that helps us manage and run all of these things. Yeah, no, for sure. I think uh, that, that's very insightful in the sense that it is going to be a level playing field for the entire industry. So it has to be a collective effort and there's only so much you can do as an individual, as an individual entity in the ecosystem. So I think the collaboration aspect yeah. is absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah. And yeah. looking forward to some like really great breakthroughs there. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to focus on another great aspect that I think uh, most of the MPA leadership has been vocal about, which is in terms of developer growth. And I was expecting that would come up almost organically, but uh, in the sense that, you know, you speak about a stakeholder that let's say a lot of people would not focus on because everybody can talk about consumers and to their own merit of course but you have been vocal about the fact that you want developers to grow you want their productivity up there and that stakeholder management aspect as a founder and leadership really echoes help us understand what are the kind of initiatives that MPL has done and what is the kind of priority that you maybe map developers for and how do you enable that within I think that would be great to hear from an educational standpoint as to what MPL MPL has been able to do for its developers. Yeah, I mean, see, just to, to straight out of the bat, to be very honest, I mean, uh, I think this there's a supremely long way to go. I think the developer ecosystem, especially around games in India, is still very, 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 very naive, or or say very nascent, nascent and naive both. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> I think I've always said this, right? Uh, the the advantage of the film industry is that language protects them, right? Uh, but games have no language. So from day zero, you're actually fighting with the world. And which is a good thing and also a bad thing, right? Um, I mean, Hollywood will struggle to make a Hindi cinema, but games, there's nothing like that, right? It's the same game the whole world plays, right? That's the beauty of games. It's the universal language. 
see from from our point of view i think uh, uh, we our growth is tied to developer growth right because we want our developers to make great games but at the same time it's a chicken and egg problem because there aren't any meaningfully large game developers who are working on ambitious projects in india right uh, uh, there you you have you have great games don't get me wrong right you have fantastic games out there but uh, but but you know i think it's still some time away hopefully in the next year that um, you know a game like say a pubg or a game like uh, you know um, say a genshin impact or maybe a game like uh, you know even clash of clans comes out of india right i think uh, that's when the true value unlocking is going to happen right games net net is still an import heavy industry right let me let me put it that way right uh, and what are we doing right what are we doing i think the first and foremost thing for us to do is to be ambitious ourselves right and ho- and hopefully in, in the near future you will see some some of the stuff coming out right it's we've been we've been extremely fortunate we've been extremely lucky to have had the kind of funding to have had the kind of people and to gotten to the point that we've gotten and if we don't take that responsibility and try try i mean whether we succeed or not nobody can guarantee but at least if we don't take that responsibility of trying to make something like that happen ourselves first and foremost we can't expect others to put their money till the time we don't put our money where our mouth is right uh, um, uh, if we don't try then i think we're doing a horrible disservice to ourselves and to the ecosystem right so first and foremost that's that's how i'd look at it right it's money in an industry is actually always the second thing you need really capable people going out and saying i'll make a cap- really really big game and i can see some of that happening the problem with game development unlike say some of the other startups or the other startup industries is that you know to make to make nothing up to take away from food delivery products or e-commerce or they're all hard businesses to run very very hard businesses to run but those products can be taken to market in 3 months 4 months you can build an mvp get it to the market test develop build 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 will and so on and so forth right you can't do that with games man you just can't you man. yeah it's like it's like telling telling a director ki tu hai na mvp launch kar apne movie ka right then show it to some people and then like you know it's not going to work right and 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 therefore by their very definition they they take longer to build they take more mm. time to perfect and that patience unfortunately is not there in our industry that uh, we we unfortunately our constant rat race of counting unicorns right right yeah. and the more important thing is you know that it's like and we should get out of that to be honest right you know nothing changes if you're a unicorn in fact one of the things i was telling one of my investors is thank god this nonsense is out of my life now right like you know <laughs> i can just sit, sit sit back and just focus on building product and doing what's right for the company so from a game point of view i think that is i think the real challenge and what are we doing for it like i said first and foremost take some of that mantle ourselves second <clears throat> second wherever we find good game developers we at least try to ensure that we bring them onto the platform and we help them make revenue so that they can go to the next step third is you know we actively actively uh you know work on uh bringing other game studios and teaching them and say times helping them with the game design and so on and so forth but it's a long road jeev raj right you know don't expect uh, you know don't don't expect us to get a rocket to the moon <laughs> in the next year it's it's, it's going to take it's going to yeah. take a while right and but what we can tell is that we are here and we are here for good and yeah. we we uh, we will we will deliver a game of that quality uh, uh, from india uh, hopefully in the near future absolutely i don't think anybody would doubt that and we'll wait for as long as it takes because i think the focus more importantly and the intent is one that really echoes for the supply side of what your business model is as well and i think that's just wonderful to witness and like other things we'll probably take more time to get there but when we do we'll be probably world class so uh, this has been wonderful sai and as we you know close down the episode i want to quickly touch your you know thoughts on what do you think about competition not from a business model perspective but only purely purely from a perspective of product usage because you spoken in the past about how this is a mind share thing how this is a content versus distribution versus product thing as well and so that perspective is usually unheard of because you look at an industry you'll take it to take three companies and you know market map what not right but you've mm-hmm. taken a different approach to it where you take a very wide canvas to what your competition could potentially be and accordingly map the future 
talk to us about how you think about that and what is the underlying ideology behind it. I think that'd be great to hear. Sure. See, I think uh, uh, one thing that uh, there's this really good game designer that I had the opportunity of working at at Zynga. And, uh, you know, he said something very profound, right? No matter the game, whatever game it is, mm-hmm. every game has a sunrise, every game has a plateau, and every game has a sunset. Mm-hmm. That's the ultimate truth about games, right? So right from day zero, the reason why we took a, we took a broad canvas is that we believe that, uh, we believe that distribution, having the power of distribution and having the power of enabling content on a platform and gaming content on a platform is way more powerful in the longer run than being fixated or married to any category. And it's just a different thought for each his own, right? In some cases, the sticking to one category is also provided like in the case of fantasy or in the case of Rami or some of the other, you know, they've done exceptionally well, right? The reason why we chose that uh, is that we believe that in the longer run, uh, distribution is what going to be ma- distribution is what is going to matter the most right mm-hmm. and we believe that having that power to distribute at scale is going to be very very valuable our opinion of competition in general always is that unless you're a single category player unless you're a single category player you are constantly a function of the quality of games you put on board right mm-hmm. like we also have those single categories on our platform we we continuously develop those single categories, and in fact, we 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 take we we put a lot of focus and energy on making those as good as the best products out there. And in some cases, we are in fact the best product out there. Uh, in some cases, we are probably second or third, but that's 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 for another day, right? But I think the advantage that you have fundamentally is that it's you're you you want to be a shopping mall, right? You don't you don't want to be a boutique shirt store. The advantage of being a shopping mall is people come in the mall to hang out, man. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you don't go to a shirt store unless you want to buy a shirt. Let me just put it that way. Of course, shirt market can be very, very big. But, mm-hmm. uh, but, but you know, the advantage of being a mall is like, you know, you can go there, hang around, like buy a pair of socks, go play a game, go watch a movie, you know, uh, get a Coke and, you know, <laughs> then go back mm-hmm. home, right? So, mm-hmm. and this is, this philosophy was something which is very clear to us. And, and, and from our point of view, uh, one of the best parts about the industry that we are in is that it's extremely competitive and it's extremely revenue generative also, right? This is one of those industries, which is my God, insane competition and insane competition, not in a way where, you know, it's like everybody's burning crazy amounts of VC money, right? Uh, It's it's a good revenue business. It's, It's a business where there's an entrenched, there are entrenched old large operators. And then there are the new guys, right? So it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. Like for me, honestly, uh, the reason why this we've been able to grow this well is also thanks to our competition, right? Like, you know, uh, there's a lot that we've learned from them, a lot that we continue to learn from them. And yeah. having such great competition means you're actually world first. What I, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. This is one of those rare industries where the competition in India is probably 10x more than the competition in the US or mm-hmm. anywhere else in the world. So by default, your product will end up being one of the best in the world. If yes. you didn't have that kind of competition in your home market, then mm-hmm. boss, it's very difficult for you to actually go out there and champion the world. So, so honestly, if someday MPL, hopefully Touchwood becomes a global product, then a, a large part of that credit goes to our competition that we have in India. Absolutely. No, I think I love that purely because I think that that provides a level playing field for everyone. And the white canvas is also a testament to the original point that we spoke about regarding, you know, the ambition that needs to be there, the large market that it is. So I think it all ties back and the circle gets completed. Um, This has been amazing, Sai. And for the last question, I want to, in fact, build on the last part. And I say this for the last because one of the foremost things that MPL is also doing is championing the cause for building a global consumer product from India for the world. And I think that is an ambition that remains to be unfulfilled. I'm sure we're going to get there and somebody, hopefully MPL will get us there. But that is, of course, a challenge there in and of itself. And MPL has been able to establish itself in Indonesia. You're now in USA as well help us understand what goes on in the background because from the outside it all seems very gloomy it all seems very supportive and we're all cheering for you but what are the intricacies of being able to achieve this and what do you think the next five years are for MPL Uh, I think that'd be a great great note to end what has been a fabulous conversation 
Yeah, so I think, see, first and foremost, man, like, you know, it's still a long way out in the US and in yeah. Indonesia. Um, it's, but the, the US especially is a humongously large market. Like it's Absolutely. humongous. It's <laughs> crazy how big that market is. Uh, see, I think uh, uh, for us, we always wanted to do this. We always felt that we want to be the global arena for competitive gameplay, right? And the, the, the problem, however, is that you're always constantly battling. It's a battle of focus. You have to have great people focusing on each of these, right? Only then will you be able to scale. And it's also a battle of, uh, it's also a battle of, uh, you know, getting the right kind of investors. I think a lot of Indian investors or a lot of folks in India, the first question they ask is, why are you focusing on the US? Why don't you focus on India? It's such a big market. You know, life is so great. You know, do India, you know, just focus on India. I mean, it's good. I mean, there's nothing wrong in that. You can focus on India, but uh, but but if there was a company that if we were a company that started out in the valley, right? Um, I'm sure that you know most of the VCs there would be saying, hey, you know what? Find great talent. Figure out a way to go to other geographies. Grow your revenues. It's going to be painful. It's going to be tough. You know, you might have to shut a few countries, then open a few countries. You might have to go through a lot of turmoil, but guess what? On the other side, you would be a product that's running in 10 different countries. I think, I think it's that ideology change for, our, for, for folks in our country. And there are many, many great products now that are doing that. In SaaS, I think we've killed it, right? To all the credit to that industry, man, they, they, they really killed it. I think now, hopefully, hopefully someone in B2C will, will, will do that. And, you know, I hope we can do it, but if not, uh, you know, I, I'm sure someone's going to do it. And I think it's all about one company going and doing it well, right? And if one company does a good job of it, trust me, man, then the floodgates are open because all, all we as an ecosystem need is belief, right? And we needed a flip card to show us belief that, you know, we can also build startups. And, and then you've seen what happened, right? Now we are counting unicorns by the day, right? And uh, I think in, in the near future, hopefully one, someone will go and build a really wonderful global product. And I think one such company is, is you know, one, some of those companies are coming out of, like, for example, Polygon, it's an Indian company now. Yeah. People across the world are using their infrastructure, right? So I'm sure more such companies will come. Absolutely. That's the hope for, I hope everyone listening in, and that's where the name of the podcast also comes from. Uh, anyway, I think this has been absolutely terrific. Thank you so much, Sai, for being your candid self and for sharing your learnings in a manner that has been so fluid. MPL is definitely such a great story in the ecosystem, and we're all cheering for it from the sidelines for it to become a humongous, humongous company. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you. No, it was a lot. It was awesome fun. Thank you for the questions and I hope your audience enjoys it as well. Thank you.